Good afternoon, or evening, or whatever you want to call this at this point. Um, my name is Chris Dennis, um, it says on the slide. Um, I work for Terracotta, um, otherwise known as Software AG. Um, I work on many things. Um, one of them is a thing on this slide. Um, so I'm going to try and do about 45 minutes, give or take. Never done this talk before, so who knows. Um, whatever you want to ask at the end, open season. I wrote most of this library, so I should know the answer. And if I don't know the answer, then I'm a bad developer. So um, who am I? I was trained as a physicist. Um, after the end of this talk, it, it might be clear that I wasn't trained as a computer scientist. Um, we're going to attempt to do some really elementary computer science, um, like 101 first year computer science stuff. Um, hopefully, it's really familiar to everyone, and so it'll be a nice, easy talk. Um, oh. I spent uh, four years doing um, unnatural things uh, with bytecode um, in academia. Um, I, in a previous existence, wrote an x86 emulator um, in Java that did um, x86 to bytecode translation. Um, I like doing weird things. Um, I then spent three years doing more weird things, um, for Terracotta, um, who, hands up if you've heard of Terracotta, by the way. Cool, I can see some hands, and I can see a really bright projector bulb. Um, sorry, um, so Terracotta was famous for a product called DSO, um, which tried, and sometimes succeeded, in um, clustering JVMs, and I did weird bytecode stuff for them. Um, I then spent four years doing unnatural things with byte buffers, um, which is what we're going to talk about. Um, yeah, that was originally with Terracotta um, as part of EH Cache. Hands up if you've heard of EH Cache. It's about the same amount of hands, I think. Cool. Um, yeah, so that's what we're going to talk about. Um, in total, I've spent 11 years doing Java development. Um, um, I still work for Terracotta uh, as part of Software AG, um, and I call myself an engineer. Not really an engineer, I guess. I'm a developer, maybe, hacker, probably. Um, so I, I mentioned this in my um, in my abstract, so I figured I should um, I should put it in my slides. I get to play with big toys. Um, if you can do the math on that kilobyte number, um, that's a big number. That's six. That's what meminfo looks like on a machine with six terabytes of RAM. Um, and there's not much free, as you can see, and that's because all of it's being used by the library. Um, it's also 120 cores. Um, that's an Intel Ivy Bridge V2 4890, as it says. Um, that machine had four CPUs. Uh, it's 15 cores of CPU, and they're hyper-threaded, so it's 120 cores in total. That chip would have cost you $6,500 when it was released last year. And we got to play with it because this was on loan from Intel. Um, $6,500 sounds like a lot of money, but this machine had somewhere between a quarter and half a million dollars worth of RAM installed in it. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the CPU is cheap. The RAM is expensive. Um, I do not recommend that you buy a six terabyte machine um, unless you enjoy burning money. Um, even Intel didn't have the six terabytes of RAM. They kept having to FedEx it around between different labs because they couldn't afford to buy it more than once. So um, that's the end of me bragging um, about the big things I play with. Um, some people might get that reference. Sorry, that was really off color. <coughs> uh, a bit of history. Um, so I started working on um, what's called within Terracotta the off-heap store library in 2010. Um, and it was originally intended as a caching tier uh, within EH Cache. Um, so the idea would be you'd have heap, off-heap, disk. Um, in 2011, um, um, so at the time, Terracotta was using Oracle BDB. Um, Anyone heard of Oracle? No hands. Obviously, nobody's heard of Oracle. Um, uh, it was uh, caching for a tier in front of Oracle BDB, otherwise known as Sleepy Cat. Um, and we stuck this thing in front of it as a caching tier, um, make the Terracotta server work better. So in 2013, um, we had um, some legal issues um, with Oracle. Surprise, surprise. Um, and so we had to push um, the off-heap store into service. It became the primary storage. It basically replaced BDB for the Terracotta server. Um, so when we tested on the six terabyte machine, that was for a, that was for a Terracotta server instance. 
2015, we finally got to open source it. Um, go to GitHub, go look at it, fork it, play with it, tell me how the things that are broken. When you look at it, you'll see it looks like code that was not developed open source. It's very a little idiosyncratic at times. Um, I apologize. If you want to propose a pull request to break all the things that I did wrong, um, to fix the things I did wrong, sorry, then, then, then I won't be offended. Um, so that's the end of the history. That's where it comes from. Um, I've been wanting to do this talk for five years. I finally get to do it. It's great. So um, problem statement. So obviously, we were writing a library, and we didn't write a library for the hell of it. Um, so first of all, um, map. I assume everyone knows what a map is, but just in case you forgot, a map is a collection of key value pairs. Um, and, and, and I just think that a cache is a map with bells on. It does some extra stuff, but in essence, it's just a map. Caching is good. Um, caching is good. I will give you a few seconds to read it. Um, it. This XKCD, some of you might remember it, it's a little bit jokey, but it's serious. Um, if we didn't have caching, good chunks of what we do wouldn't work. Caching allows us to have large stores that operate with the latency of small stores because of the wonders of the Pareto distribution. So um, more problem statement, more problems. So lots of caching is good. Caching is good. Let's have lots of caching. We've got big data. Let's have big caching. Um, problem is, um, lots of caching um, causes lots of heap. Um, big heaps. Yeah, fun. Um, no. Um, that's lots of work for the garbage collector. Um, and unfortunately, that leads to um, a lot of GC pausing um, and overhead. Um, Please don't tell my employer, like it says, please don't tell my employer I said that. I'll make sure they never watch the video. The situation is markedly better now than when I started in 2010. Um, there was no G1 out. Um, the limit on what you could really do in a heap without starting to worry it hit pauses, particularly with CMS, was probably 8 gig. Depending on your workload, you could push harder. But, um, but the ceiling was around there. Um, nowadays, you can push tens of gig, probably pushing 50 gig with G1, um, and hundreds of gig if you've got Zing or Zulu or whatever you want to call it, Azul's offering. Um, and Shenandoah is obviously in the pipe. Um, that doesn't replace the need for libraries like this. It just pushes our, the tipping point out a little further. So, so we have this problem. Um, we have a lot of GC overhead. So, so let's think. Map cache best practices. Hands up if you think, I'm going to say this very carefully, hands up if you think mutable keys are a good idea in a map. Mutable. Mutable. Do you think you should mutate the keys in your map? Yes. Please do this. If you don't do this, and we've had customers do this, very weird things happen. And the customer gets very confused, and you get stuck in awkward support calls where you can't call the customer the word you want to call them, um, but you really, really want to say it. Um, immutable values. Who thinks that mutable values are a good idea in a map? Sweet. You guys are smart. Please have immutable values. <laughs> yeah. People are waving their hands around. If you're going to have mutable values, you are going to be doing multi-threaded programming. If you can avoid doing multi-threaded programming, avoid doing multi-threaded programming. Um, in particular, if in, in the case of like marshalling things onto disk and stuff, you obviously can't mutate, because then the question is, that's done asynchronously, what exactly are you putting in the map? You don't know, because you don't know when the mutation happened, when the, when the marshalling happened, rather, sorry. So we've got immutability everywhere, because we're good people. Um, but if we have immutability, who really cares about object identity? I can just copy the object freely, give you a copy of it. As long as the state's the same, you don't care. So if there's no object identity, do I really need a heap? I don't need the object identity I get from it. I don't need to always use the same reference. I can copy it all over the place. No heap? Cool. No garbage collector? Brilliant. No garbage collector, no overhead. So the solution is obvious. We're going to replace all of our heavy, by which we mean large, map cache usage with an outside of the heap, but inside the process implementation. Please don't do this with the small stuff. You are taking a hit. 
If it's too big to fit in the heap, move it. If not, leave it where it lies. So this is benefits at two scales. At moderate scale, which when we started was probably in a sort of 20, 30 gig scale, or maybe even smaller potentially, um, you're going to reduce the, G you're going to offload the GC, and that's going to reduce overheads. Um, at large scale, um, we can still function. Do not do that. That is not going to function on any VM out there. I don't think even Azul is going to handle that. Um, so there are some caveats, obviously. This is not free lunch. The marshalling and unmarshalling you're going to end up doing is going to cost you time. Um, and obviously, latency is very important to most people nowadays. I mean, obviously, it also costs you CPU. There's going to be overhead. It's going to cause everything else to run slower. Um, but what you're doing here is you're doing a trade-off. Most people's SLAs are not expressed in average latency, particularly in modern OLTP applications. What you're doing is your SLA is based on a 99th percentile or a 99.9th percentile or something like that. So you care more about the tail latencies, the latencies when you get a GC pause, the latencies when you're stuck in disk I.O., than you do about the latency in the good case. So you're trading away average latency in order to control the tail. So we want to do an off-heap map. What do we need? We need a map. Um, so we need to replace Java util map, be that hash map, hash set, whatever you want to think of it as. Um, we need a heap. We don't have a heap anymore. So we need something to stand in for the heap. And we're going to need something to stand in for the job of the garbage collector. We need something to clean up the things that we remove from the map. We need to make sure that we free the off heap. Um, we need something for class layout logic, effectively the marshalling. Um, and eventually, we're going to need a concurrent hash map. So um, this is where we get technical. Now we're going to start talking about how we replace each of these things. So let's start with the map. So JDK hash map, let's talk about how it works. Buckets, we'll call these things buckets. So a regular hash map, this one has eight buckets. And the way it works is we say we want to do a put. And so we hash the, take the hash code of the key. We probably spread the hash code to give us a nicer, more even distribution in case somebody's got a bad hash code function or a hash code function that constrains itself to one portion of the integer space. Spread the bits around. Then we're going to effectively do a modulo division or a bit mask and figure out where it goes. Boom. So it hashes to the third bucket. Cool. Stick the key value there. Do another put. Sweet. Another value. Do a third put. Oh. It's hashed to the same bucket. A conventional JDK hash map at this point is going to do that. It's going to form, so in, in, prior to 1.8, it would form a linked list, which is what I'm representing there. Um, 1.8 and beyond, it actually forms a tree if the keys are comparable, which gives you better performance if you've got bad hash codes. It degrades as O log n rather than O n. Um, but, but the essence is that the collision is controlled or handled by forming a data structure within the bucket. That is not how the off-heap map works. So we do the puts. Oh, this looks familiar. It's doing all the same things. Sweet. Everything's going fine. Make sure I don't go too far. Cool. We're about to put. The thing is, we want to try and minimize the number of data structures we have to create here. The more code we have to write, the more chance we write bugs. So what do we choose to do? We choose to build a different kind of map. Rather than forming a data structure off of that entry that we put in, we reprobe. And we say, right, that slot's not there. We can't use that slot. It's taken. Let's reprobe to a new slot. We put the value there. Cool. What we just did is what's called a linear reprobe. Um, linear reprobe is usually done by reprobing to the next slot. Your principal could reprobe to the fifth slot, and then the tenth slot, and the fifteenth slot. Here we're going to do first slot, second slot, third slot, and so on. Um, you keep reprobing up to a certain point, what's called the reprobe limit. At that point, you say, if you can't find an empty slot, you go, oh, 
crap. No space, right. Rehash, make the map bigger, try again. What that's called a linear repro. Um, the reason we pick that is it's cache friendly. Um, it's, um, it's simple. Um, it's cache friendly because obviously the machine may well have fetched the same slot, the next slot in the same cache line. Um, it's more prone to clustering effects. If you have bad hash codes, you can get clustering of the slots in the slots. And at that point, then you hit the repro limit early before you've got too many mappings in, and you end up with an inefficient map that takes too much space. You can also do um, quadratic reprobe, where you reprobe by one, then two, then four, then eight, which tends to smear things out and you get better behavior. You can also do a, a, a hashing reprobe where you take a secondary hash function. Um, one quick point here. Um, we're starting to hit problems where the 32-bit hash code we get in Java isn't big enough because we're starting to get to maps with, with pushing up against 4 billion entries. Um, and obviously, at that point, you, it doesn't matter how many, time, well, how many times you have, how many more keys you try and put in, they're always colliding because there's no space for more spread hash codes. Um, so yeah, so we're probably going to have to move to long hash coding soon. There's actually a branch in my own fork of the library that, that looks at doing that. Um, you can go and check that out if you want. I don't know if it actually works yet, but it's being played with. Cool, so this is a hash map. The style of what we just talked about, where we reprobe, is called open addressing. Um, and it's a linear reprobe, one slot. Cool, um, so, so what are these K, KV things? So in a JDK hash map, it's that. It's a Java object. Um, it stores the hash, which allows it to rapidly check the hash, which it does as a precursor to do it calling equals, because it's faster. Um, and it caches it rather than obviously having to call hash code. Um, it obviously saves the key, it saves the value, and it saves this next thing, which is the reference. So, so we've got a primitive. That's nice and easy to store in our heap. We have um, this thing. It's closed addressing specific. We don't care. Don't need that. Oh, those are heap references. That's a problem. So, so what do we do? OK. So this is the off heap map. It is a struct, but not in the C sense. Well. Yes, in the C sense, but it's not a C struct. It's a struct. We'll call it a slot. Um, it contains an integer, which is the status, which tells us, because obviously these things always exist. The status tells us, basically as a bit mask, tells us if it's present. We can also mark remove slots. We won't talk about removing. Um, and also, um, I can got 30 extra bits to do naughty things with if I want to store random Boolean metadata. Um, it stores the hash, just like. JDK's map does. Um, and it stores a long encoding. So we've got primitives, cool. And this encoded key value pair. So how is that encoded? Oh, well, it's just done with an abstraction. You have a storage engine. Um, and it's got all the obvious methods. You can write a mapping that takes a key and a value, and it returns a long. It returns a bigger long because it can fail, and then it returns null. Um, the metadata is the extra stuff you stick in a slot in the status integer. Um, you can free the mappings, you can read them, and you can check them for equality, which is obviously potentially more efficient than unmarshalling them. Um, this is slightly edited, because reality is always worse than you want it to be. Um, there are some other obscure methods in here to do with um, caching um, marshaled representations in case you have to run around multiple times, and then invalidating the caches, and all sorts of other weird gunk. Um, if you want to look at it and then ask me why the hell I did things, go ahead and I'll try and explain it. Um, so we've got 64 bits to store our key and value. Um, we can obviously use all 64 for a combined pointer. Um, we can store a 32-bit key pointer and a 32-bit value pointer, but then we're up against a 4 gig limit. So we're going to run into problems having really big maps. Um, we can store an integer. If the key is an integer, we can just write it straight down. And then we have a 32-bit pointer for the value. And obviously, um, we can do long keys directly because of the contract of long's hash code. Um, just think XOR and do the math in your head. And obviously, anything else you like. Um, you can implement that interface and do whatever you want. You want byte keys, short keys, char keys. You want to, uh, I don't know, store zip codes, something weird. You've got 64 bits to play with. So we have a map. Um, Nice and simple. Um, but um, what are our pointers pointing to? 
we are going to need a replacement for that. The Java heap, where we store all the objects. So um, a native heap. We want a block of memory that we can write to. Um, and um, I've put logical address space in brackets. Anyone who's worked on an x86, done any kind of low level, really low level programming in x86, that term should look familiar. Um, so should that term. Um, it's exactly like this. We form an address space out of pages. Um, our pages are also not necessarily evenly sized. We allow them to vary. You can specify a fixed page size, or you can specify a min and a max, and we grow them as you grow the area. And which means if you don't know how big it's going to be, you can be far more efficient rather than wasting dead space at the end of a page. But, but what's, what's inside a page? Um, it's a slice of a byte buffer. Um, this is all just straight NIO. It's a slice of a byte buffer. But where do the slices come from? They come from that. It's an allocate direct. Um, and that's effectively our physical address space. In reality, the slices obviously can potentially come from different source byte buffers. Um, and so what we actually do here is we're going to allocate, when we start up and you say, I want a 32 gig off heap area, we're just going to malloc 32 gig of space. And then there's a thing called a page source that's responsible for carving those allocated byte buffers up into pages as they're asked for. Hopefully, um, that makes sense. So it's exactly like the, kind of like a small portion of the memory model of an x86. Um, the only problem is this is flat. We've just got a byte addressable memory block that we can write into, but no control. So um, how do we manage that heap? We need a garbage collector. Um, I am going to show the next slide. Our heap allocator, our native heap allocator, is um, who, hands up if you've heard of Doug Lee. Cool. Um, we use this thing called DL malloc, and, 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 and DL malloc stands for Doug Lee. And anyone who's ever looked at the um, the JSR 166 stuff is going to recognise that URL. So back in early 90s, maybe even late 80s, um, Doug Lee wrote uh, an implementation of malloc free in C. And um, it was very widely used. It was, I think it's still the standard malloc free in lots of Linuxes. It's used by lots of popular software projects. So what did we do? We said, well, we have a big byte addressable area, and we need to do malloc free. Well, we don't need to write malloc free. It's been written a million times. Let's just take one. So we took Dougley's malloc free, and we ported it. Um, now. One thing to remember, this is for EH cache, where the user throws us keys and values. And we have no idea what size they're going to be. So we are the perfect use case for a general purpose malloc free. If you were taking our library and forking it or, you, or embedding it, you might want to think about replacing this if you know that your keys and values are going to be fixed sizes. Because there's a lot of overhead here with handling and making sure you don't fragment when you are dealing with random sizes thrown at you. Um, if anybody wants to know how this works, they can either go to that website, or you can come and ask me at the end, and I will give you my really poor man's explanation of how Dougley's Mac Free works. Um, that's it. Like It's not my code. It was just a port. It's a bit awkward porting C code to Java, but it's not in principle, complicated. So we're doing pretty well. We have a map, we have a heap, we have a garbage collector. Marshalling. So we need to know how to take a POJO and stick it in the off heap. Hands up if you think that's true. Cool. Why is that true? Does anybody want to voice an opinion? or? It's slow. That is indeed true. Um, I like to think of why Java civilization sucks. You're right, it is slow, and there are ways it could be made better. But many of the reasons that it sucks is because you don't need it. It's self-describing. A serialization stream contains a complete description of the types that are within the stream. 
It supports object identity. If you have an object graph and you reference the same object multiple times, the serialization stream understands that. And when you deserialize, it will only construct one object, and it will get all the references right. It supports cycles in the object graph. Most people don't have cycles in their object graphs. But this will handle it, and so therefore it tracks every single object that goes in and makes sure it doesn't serialize them twice. It also supports complex versioning. Most people don't use this, but it does it. Um, this thing is heavyweight. It's really kind of nuts. It's trying to be the all-encompassing serialization mechanism for any arbitrary use case. That's, to me, that's why it sucks. It could be made slightly better, maybe, without breaking its feature set. But the reality is most people think it sucks because they don't want it. They want something with a smaller feature set that's lighter weight. Our problem is we have short streams. Because we have a stream with at most a key and a value. And then you have to stop the marshalling and save it. Right. It's the default serialization mechanism available in the hcache2x. This is why we have no choice. We have to be able to handle an arbitrary POJO that wants to be serialized. Um, in the hcache3x that we're working on now, the serialization scheme is completely pluggable. It obviously defaults to, um, to, to, to Java serialization, but in 2x, you can't even change it without doing hackery in the source code. So. Um, I'm going to serialize an integer. Um, do you think that's it? Is it more than that? Less than that? Hands up if you think that's all I need. Cool. What about that? Is that enough? More? What about that? Or uh, that? Or uh, that? Oh, look, there's 2a. What do we think 2a is? 2a is 42. That is 81 bytes for a four-byte structure. If you were being really mean, you could say it's a one-byte value. Um, this sucks. Um, in off-heap, we have a form of Java serialization that is exactly the same feature set-wise, but results in 22 bytes. It's this byte stream. Um, I think that's a lot better. It's still not ideal. And this is why, in 3, I would recommend you customize if you're dealing with stupidly tiny keys and you know that you can control them and write your own serializer. You could obviously plug in cryo or protocol buffers or whatever you want as well. But again, it requires upfront knowledge of the typeset. Um, so this is what a serialization stream looks like. <coughs> um, the magic's two bytes, the version's two bytes, then there's byte flags everywhere. There's full-blown serialization UIDs. It encodes the name of every field, its type, which are luckily, in, in this case, the fields are primitives. But if the fields are classes, you get the fully qualified name of class. Um, it's nuts. Um, so that's what it looks like in off-heap. It's structurally the same, but what did we do? Kind of tell from there. So where'd the 59 bytes go? How many types are in my map? All the keys being the same type is extremely common, like probably 90 plus percent of all use cases. All values being the same type, fairly common, probably one type, 80 percent plus, two or let two types, or maybe three types, 90 percent plus. So. We've got a huge amount of redundant data, because most of that serialization stream was the object stream class. It's the thing that describes what the class looks like. So stick those in a look aside structure. So it's just two maps. We have a map from the integer, from an integer to an object stream class for reading. We have a map from, oh, what the hell is that? Sorry, almost cursed. Get in trouble. Um, what the hell is that thing? It's a serializable data key, because helpfully enough, Object stream class doesn't have an equals contract. Um, so basically, what we then do is we say, on read, you look through the stream and you see the integer and you say, what type's that? I look it up in the map, it returns the object stream class. That's the object stream class that it deserializes to. And I read the damn thing. And on write, 
I go to write it, and if there's a serializable data key that matches my object string class, then I can pull the integer and write it to the string. Um, there's a whole bunch of, even though this is a tiny piece of code, there's a huge amount of logic around this because you have to handle like class file evolution. You have to make sure that you weakly reference everything and don't accidentally strongly reference a class, otherwise you call, cause leaks all over the place. Writing general purpose libraries is no fun. So serialization is pretty malleable. This is what we're using, um, write class descriptor and read class descriptor. You just subclass those two classes in JDK, use those, everything's done. Um, there's a huge amount more customization you can do on Java serialization. You can pretty much make it do whatever it wants. Um, there's obviously a bunch of overhead you can't eliminate, and, and things like Cryo are always going to be better. But, um, but for us, this was a, this was a brilliant result. Um, if the serialization still sucks, if you're using us directly, you can just implement that interface. You just say, here's the object. Give me a byte buffer that represents the object. I'll write that. Give me the byte buffer. Here's a byte buffer. Please give me the object it represents. And there's, again, there's an equals method in case you can do that more efficiently somehow. Obviously, that, that would potentially involve, because this thing is going to be called in a safe context. You can read out the byte buffer direct and compare. If you know where the fields are, you can read direct. So am I on time? Eh, going a little fast. We're going to have more time for questions. Sorry. So we have everything we need, except it's not concurrent. So what does a concurrent map provide? I've got time, so I'm going to ask the audience. What does a concurrent map provide, anyone? What does it give you that a map doesn't give you? Non cool. That's not the first thing on my slide. I wish Keynote could do nonlinear presentations, by the way. So I could go, you said that. Right, show that one. Don't show the first one. Oh. Ah, don't tell me my remote has run out of battery at this point. That's nuts. Right. Cool. What does a concurrent map provide? It happens before relationship. To me, this is the most fundamental thing. The next one is what you said. So the happens before relationship says, if I <laughs> actions in a thread prior to placing an object into a concurrent map as a key or value happens before actions. If you haven't read the Java memory model, this might not make a lot of sense to you. Basically, it guarantees if you stick something in, I'm going to wave my hands. You will immediately see it in other threads. That is some hand waving. And you will also see anything the writer thread did before it put it in. Go read the Java memory model, wait for your brain to calm down again, and then, and then maybe reread that sentence. Um, it also does um, atomic operations. So you can say put, in, put if absent, um, two arg remove, two arg replace, three arg replace, those kind of things. Actually, that's all of them, but anyway. Um, thing is, that's nice, and that's all the contract says. Um, we want something more. We probably want that. We want concurrent access. We want to be able to have multiple readers in the map and multiple writers, and potentially multiple writers at the same time, which you can do with JDK 8's concurrent hash map. Um, here's the... Um, the kicker, you don't actually have to have that to be a concurrent map per contract. So um, it's kind of, we want it, but we don't actually have to deliver it. Um, so happens before relationships. Um, we need a happens before relationship. Um, there's a bunch of different ways of getting that. Uh, we can do volatile writes and reads. There's a happens before relationship there. Ah, but you can't do that on an memory location. Please don't say unsafe, we're getting to it. Synchronized, sweet. I can get it with a synchronization block. Some exclusion two, which is annoying, um, but that needs a heap object. Crap, I don't have those. Um, I can do it with a bunch of other Java util concurrent classes. I can have, I can have locks. I can have atomic things. I can have barriers. I can do lock support. Park. I can do bunches of weird stuff. Um, but all of that again needs a heap object. I need something to share the state through, or I need something to lock on, or whatever. Um, there is no way within the JDK to enforce happens before relationships between writes and reads of an off-heap location without resorting to some heap object to help you. 
I said within the JDK. So a um, bunch of other people um, use unsafe to do off-heap stuff. I've never seen it to be a bottleneck in our usages. In our usages is important. Um, maybe other people have tighter performance requirements. Maybe, they, maybe we've got bottlenecks that I don't know about. I've never seen it to be a problem. The key thing after that is that unnecessary complexity costs money. We're a business. You have to support it, which is complicated, particularly if, I don't know, Oracle decide they want to remove access to it. And then you get all panicked because you suddenly realized you built your business hinging upon it. Um, you have to maintain the solution, which means if unsafe changes its contract, which you won't be told about, then you have a problem. Um, it causes bugs. Um, what if there are bugs in unsafe? Then you have suddenly have to plead with Oracle to fix bugs in an API they never promised to support. Um, you can fix your car like this. You will successfully fix your car nine times out of ten. You will successfully kill yourself on the tenth attempt. So, um, so we don't use unsafe. Um, personally, couldn't speak for other people. So, simple solution. We have this. We have an off-heap map. We have an off-heap memory area. We have Dio Malloc and we have a serializer. We just do that. We wrap it in a heap object. We have a read-write lock. We wrap the whole thing. We have a concurrent off-heap map that just says, let's protect all the off-heap stuff with a read-write lock. We write lock on mutative things. We read lock on non-mutative things. And everything magically works. So we have a concurrent map. It has a happens before relationship because the lock gives it to us. We get atomic operations because the lock on mutation provides exclusion. So you want to do a put if absent, lock that map. Do the get, see what's there. If there's nothing there, do the put, release the lock. We don't really have concurrent access, though. Um, we have concurrent readers because we can have multiple people take the read lock. We don't have concurrent writers because there's exclusion. So um, we need more write concurrency. Um, so we just do that. We say, oh, we want two concurrent writers? Right, let's have two maps. One and three can write to one map, one and three can write to the other. So, oh, sorry, hang on. I keep looking at my presence at the moment and getting confused. So you don't put. What do you do? You do the put, you take the hash code of the key, you send it into some striping logic, which is doing exactly the same thing that the, striping, that the hash code logic does when it's accessing the map to find a bucket. It's saying, let's take some of the bits, well, stir the bits up, find some bits, and assign us to one of the maps. And as long as that assignment's stable, everything's good, as long as you don't mutate the key. Don't mutate the key. So we get key value mapping. And that's cool. There is one thing to watch out for here, and we actually got bitten by this. You have to be careful that the striping logic in the concurrent map isn't using the same bits to decide which segment to go to, or which piece of the map to go to, as you are then using inside the map to decide which bucket to go to. Otherwise, you artificially cause clustering. Um, there was an early version of this called years and years ago that actually did that. We didn't find it out until we borrowed, at that time, a 768 gig UCS box from Cisco and ran the thing at massive scale. And suddenly, there was a massive degradation in performance. And it was because I had screwed up in the striping logic and was sharing common bits, and everything fell apart. Um, you end up with things going sort of not O n in the map, but at least O some fraction of n. And performance drops through the floor, and you wonder what the hell went on. And your manager says, what did you do? Um, and then you go, I'm an idiot, and I fixed it. Um, so obviously, a second put is just going to do that. And a third put is just going to do that. So we have more write concurrency. We actually have a complete solution. We have a map, a concurrent map. 
we have a replacement for the Java heap, we have a replacement for the garbage collector, and we have a replacement for class layout logic. So um, I'm actually slightly ahead of where I wanted to be. We're going to have 20 minutes for questions. Um, I hope I didn't go too fast. I apologize. Um, you can always watch it back on like half speed on YouTube. Simple engineering. Simple engineering is simpler to support and maintain. Do not over-engineer your solutions. Even though when you get into this kind of thing, it's really tempting. Like you start playing with this stuff and you get going, I'm a, like a code ninja. I'm going to write the best off heap implementation you've ever seen. It's going to use unsafe. It's going to do everything magic. It's going to be insane. But if you don't need that insanity, if you don't need all that fancy stuff, if you don't need that performance, if your testing doesn't show that you're suffering from not using unsafe, don't do it. Simple engineering is simpler to support and simpler to maintain. And at the end of the day, there's the whole thing about assume that the guy that maintains your code is a psychopath who knows where you live. In actual fact, it's usually you, which might be the same thing. Um, you are not going to like your former self if you write an overly complicated solution. And going off heap doesn't require unsafe, unless ultimate performance is your primary concern. If you really do need an insanely performant off-heap solution, then by all means, go unsafe. Just realize it comes with significant caveats. So um, that's kind of the end. But um, there's a bunch of other stuff going on in the library that I didn't talk about. Um, so we didn't actually talk about how we cache. Um, the whole thing um, supports weekly consistent iterators like you see in concurrent hash map, and doing that's not easy when you have to deal with the fact that the map might be resizing underneath you. Um, we do this thing called cross-segment eviction. Um, I'm going to describe all these because I have the time, and you're stuck here. Well, not really. You can leave. Um, but also, in case you want to ask questions, so cross-segment eviction is if you wanted to put a really big value in the map, and you've got a multi-segmented map, but there's not enough space allocated to your segment to fit it, and then you need to kick things out of other things in your cache to fill space in that one. Um, page stealing helps support cross-segment eviction. It's to do with stealing pages from other places using um, page allocation stuff. Um, we have to be able to compact the native heap to try and prevent fragmentation in certain bad scenarios. We have to be able to rehash to grow and shrink, which is something most maps don't do. Um, there's an entire off-memory solution that involves SSDs. There's an entire another layer that I can maybe talk about, although it's still proprietary at the moment, that does um, proper like ACID-like durability. So if you crash the machine, everything comes back. There's this hideous thing called entry-level pinning, which allows you to prevent certain cache items from being evicted. And I'm not sure I ever want to talk about it again. Um, and there's probably other stuff um, that I forgot about here. Um, yeah, so if you want to ask about that in a, minute, in a second, then we can. If you have any questions about what I showed, you can ask those. Um, if you have any other questions, sure. Um, questions. Um, by the way, we're hiring. Um, we're doing a bunch of fun stuff, um, not just, well, with off-heap, but moving on from this and doing fancier off-heap data structures. Um, we may even start using unsafe at some point. Who knows? Um, if you're interested in very low-level Java development, distributed systems, off-heap solutions, um, data modeling, Java 8 streams, lambdas, or anything like that, people are looking puzzled, <laughs> um, then come and talk to me. Um, that is the GitHub URL again. Um, the drone that you might have seen at our, our booth is being raffled at 7 PM. So that's in about 15 minutes or so um, in front of our booth. Um, if you want it and you've entered, then you're going to have to be there. Um, I promise I will end the Q&A before, because I'll probably have to be there or I'll get in trouble. Um, that is the end of my presentation. Um, does anybody have a question? Questions? I can't see. So if you're holding your hand up, yes. Um, native heat compression. So um, one of the things we run into is that um, when you're running it as a cache, so if you fill, if you have one of these, right, and you fill it, you smoothly fill the native heap. 
And so you've got this big block of contiguous allocated memory, right? And then what happens is <coughs> you, um, if you start evicting because it's a cache, you end up producing random holes everywhere. That wouldn't normally be a problem because new puts coming in can refill the holes in. It becomes a problem when you're dealing with a multi-segment um, a multi-segment cache where I suddenly, so suppose I've got like two segments, right? 200 meg, because we'll deal with small numbers because they're easier. I fill the whole thing. It's been evicting for ages. So what I've got is 200 meg, but with holes all over the place. And then I try and stick a 120 meg value in. The problem is that it needs to kick things out of both segments. And the way it does that is by stealing pages out from underneath the segment you're not assigned to. But in order to steal a page, it needs to free everything. Um, and in order to do that, it needs to compact all the values so that, so that there's a page that's completely unused. Um, there's more detail than that. But it's basically that in DL malloc, the way it works, you actually end up with, a, with a, being able to navigate the assigned pointers. And so the way it works is we just um, find the last thing, take it, try and reallocate and move it down, and just do that consecutively until we've cleared up as much of the fragmentation as we need. It's a pretty rare occurrence. The problem with writing a general purpose library where you don't control the use cases is there's almost no, eventually you end up having to cover every single edge case. Because eventually, because there's a large number of users, it's not like you control the usages. Eventually, every single edge case gets found. And every single edge case has to be fixed. Um, I won't say it's bug-free, but it's probably the most bug-free piece of software I've ever written, just because it's had five years of being bashed at by thousands of people, and every bug that's found we've had to fix, because we, we can't say, oh, we just won't tickle that one, because some customer is going to come along and be awkward. Um, that was not a great explanation. Um, there are not great explanations for some of these things. I apologize. So, okay, so um, the question was, why did, you do, why did I decide to go with malloc and free rather than di just directly allocating? I assume you mean just directly allocating a direct byte buffer when I need to store something. So there's two problems with that. One is you now have a direct byte buffer that you have to keep a reference to. That can only be kept in the heap. And so suddenly, you're, you're basically, your heap usage is linear in the number of entries in the map. Which is obviously better because you're not you're only storing the reference. But the problem is the thing that tends to cause GC overhead isn't the size of the heap, it's the amount of walking that it ends up having to do. Um, how long it takes to walk the heap. And if you have a direct byte buffer for every entry, you have a reference for every entry and the heap and the, the GC ends up having to walk it. The other thing that's sort of that's the main reason. There is another reason, which is that whenever you allocate a, whenever you call allocate direct, it not only does it malloc, but Java, for security reasons, because of the sandbox, will zero out the memory. Um, malloc, some malloc implementations will do that too. Um, some of them will do it more efficiently, like they'll background free stuff and background zero stuff out and things. I can get away with not doing that and being cheeky because everything's inside the same map. So what I actually do when I'm doing malloc free is just malloc it. And if it happens to be dirty, it doesn't matter because I'm about to write through it all again. So it saves me basically one. I, I end up only writing half the bytes I would otherwise have written. Cool. Um, if anyone else is holding their hand up and I can't see them because the projector is blinding me, um, just talk. Cool. No more questions. Um, thank you very much. Um, Please come down if you are too shy to ask a question. I will try and remember to look at the website where you can ask offline questions. My Twitter handle is behind me, maybe. Um, you can tweet me questions, um, and I will endeavor to get to those this evening. Um, I'm running a boff tonight at 9. If you feel like staying up in the venue until 9 o'clock, you can come to my boff. It's nothing to do with off heap. And if you don't hate me now, you'll probably hate me after my boff. So. Um, so please come to my boff and hate me.